Good morning, Waterline. You can have a seat if you are here in the room. Thank you, team, for leading us in that and that truth and the truth uh, in all of those songs. Um, If I have not met you, my name is Pastor Laura, and I'm just super excited to be here with you, whether you're here in person or whether you're part of our church family that's joining us online. Actually, can we just go ahead and give a hand? If you're here in person, just give a hand to our church family. Welcome them. They're joining us online. We are glad you are joining us. Um, Also, if you have been to Waterline before, you probably already know this, but we really like to celebrate. It's like kind of a thing we do. We celebrate a lot. Actually, um, our staff, um, every single Monday morning, we we spend time celebrating, and so we're going to celebrate. We have made it through January, okay? So let's celebrate. Tell your neighbor, good job. Just let them know, good job, you made it. You made it through January, um, but we're celebrating because not only um, do we make it through January, but there has just been an incredible time, as Pastor Scott shared uh, earlier, just in this series, Take Back Your Life, and I know uh, many of us have just um, really enjoyed it, but the celebration in that is that it's not, um, not just January, but there have been so many conversations sparked and prayers prayed. Um, eyes opened to what it means to take back your life. And I think um, every single one of us, um, as we've experienced this, have had some kind of growth or some kind of aha moment or some kind of next step or some kind of, wow, like that really has me thinking. And um, so we're celebrating that. We're celebrating that and we're celebrating because what we've found is is that take back your life, um, there's an urgency that has risen up in us to not just start the year, start 2021 with another New Year's resolution and the possibility of a high failure rate and whatever goal we set, but rather to start 2021 with a new beginning, a new beginning that can only come from God, an experience with God. And so we are celebrating that today and celebrating just what God is doing Um, this journey for us has not only sparked a lot of conversations, but as Pastor Elizabeth and Pastor Scott have just, um, and Pastor Zach have shared with us, just uh, the idea and the understanding that if life is a river, we remember this, this picture, if life is a river and culture is the current, is the water coming at us, we have the choice to stand firm and to root ourselves rather than to just let uh, the water and life just kind of come at us and we just move or we feel wobbly. And so we've, we've realized that we have a choice to stand firm and to root ourselves in God's truth. And Elizabeth, Pastor Elizabeth put that so brilliantly, the different things that we can do to root ourselves. But then the last couple of weeks as Pastor Zach and Pastor Scott um, also taught that real life is that sometimes it's hard to stand firm. That if we think of ourselves in this river and life's coming at us and culture is coming at us, if we're being honest with ourselves, which we need to be, all of us, uh, there are times in life where uh, standing firm feels really hard and you find yourself either like wobbly or feeling off balance or why can I not do this? Or to be honest, sometimes we feel like our feet are totally swept out from underneath us. And standing firm is one of the last things that we feel like we can do. Uh, These are strongholds in our lives. Habits, actions, sins, thoughts, weaknesses, whatever they look like, they have us really frustrated. Really frustrated with ourselves, feeling chained up, Or to be honest, a lot of times the very things in life that you're so frustrated with yourself about that you feel like you just can't stop doing, or why do I do this? Why do I always do that? Why do I always act like that? Has you really tired, right? Has you really, really tired. And these strongholds in our lives have us feeling like victory is anything but possible. The whole reason that you would feel the need to take back your life is because if we're being honest, there are strongholds that have us wobbling in the river. As Pastor Scott taught last week, while everyone's strongholds can look different, in a sense, they're all the same. Same anatomy, and we have a graphic here. Really, they're all made up of layers, 
layers upon layers that at the very root starts with a lie from the enemy. At the very root starts with a lie. And as the enemy spreads the lies throughout those layers, they only tighten their grip and their influence on our lives. You may remember, uh, Pastor Scott also shared that it's kind of like a dandelion. If the lie, if the original lie was a dandelion, it has the ability to spread into all the other layers, only reinforcing the lies, then getting to the stronghold, which is the very thing that you're so frustrated with, has the ability to spread really easily, layer by layer, taking considerable ground. But this morning, we're going to pick up where Pastor Scott left off, and learn how to deconstruct the layers, right? That if we have this in our life and we're tired of it and we're frustrated and we know that it's the thing that is keeping us wobbly in the river or sweeping us out from our feet, how do we get through the layers? How do we practically deconstruct the layers? Because the, to be honest, friends, it is obvious that there are strongholds in our lives, but we have to sit in something. While strongholds exist so can victory. Let me say that one more time, and I'm saying it to myself. While strongholds exist, so does victory. So Father, as your word says, that we would know the truth, and the truth would set us free. This morning, as we continue on this journey together as a church, as friends, as family, did we hear you and you only would we experience you and you only? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, we're going to get practical, and I don't know about you, uh, by raise of hands or let us know in the comments if you're watching online, how many of you are a, a list person? You like the practical, give me the step-by-step, step, so you, you know who you are, right? The practical, step-by-step, step, bulleted, organized, color-coded, you know, sub-points, all of it, right? Even me just saying that makes you feel really good, right? All the list people are like, please, please, where's the journal? Where's the office supply section? We will get practical today, and I, I want to, and I want to give the list. You're going to get a list, and you're going to get the points. Um, but as I was preparing this week, I was making the list, and my heart was really stirred to realize um, there is a list of spiritually practical things that we can do to defeat the layers. But we have to be really careful that this is not just a formula or a punch code this isn't just a, a cheat sheet to getting through the Mario, uh, the Mario levels and trying to save the princess. Instead, you're just actually taking back your life at the end of it. And we would be doing a disservice to ourselves if we left it at just a list and just a how-to of layers. We would be doing a disservice to ourselves. And as I sat there this week and I was thinking about this, there was a truth um, that I was struck with, and hear me, friends, again, I'm talking to myself, too, that the greatest way to take back your life is to lay it down. Before I go on any list or give you any tips, give you anything to do tomorrow or this evening or to write in your journal, the greatest way to take back your life is to lay it down. And it looks like realizing and understanding that there is a God who is a good father. That not only in this world where strongholds exist that can leave you feeling hopeless and defeated and drowning in life, there is a God. A God that has made you on purpose and for a purpose. A God that calls you a masterpiece. A God that wants to transform, not just patch up, but transform your mind, thoughts, and actions a God that gives you the opportunity to change the way you think, a God that takes your confession of brokenness and offers sweet forgiveness, a God that wants to take your stronghold, even the ones that very few may know about, the stronghold in your life, and he wants to give you victory, a God that wants to take and, and teach you that every layer of the lie, he wants to take it and he wants to replace it with truth, a truth that he is with for and not finished with you. A God that loved you so much, 
all of us, that he sent his son to die on a cross who knew no sin, to experience the weight of guilt, shame, regret, sin, and strongholds, so that you and I don't have to be hopeless in our own. There is a God that along with forgiveness has sent help. So that as we suit up for battle, as we make our lists, we get the weed killer for the dandelions, as we grab the anchors to stand in the river, we don't have to do it in a strength on our own that he provides a strength through the Holy Spirit that is available. Romans 8, 5 through 6 says, Those who live as their human nature tells them to have their minds controlled by what human nature wants. Those who live as the Spirit tells them to have their minds controlled by what the Spirit wants. To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. I was reading this week in the Jesus Storybook Bible. Hands up in comments as well. Hands up if you guys have heard of this. Anybody heard of the Jesus Storybook Bible? It is for kiddos, but I have to be honest, I wasn't reading it with any kids this week. I was reading it by myself, and it's incredibly powerful in the story of Scripture and using Scripture And as I was um, thinking first about the list that we're going to talk about, so don't worry, we will talk about that, ways to deconstruct the layers. But as I was thinking about God sending help, there's a section in this, God sends help. And in this section, it's from Acts and from John, and it's talking about how uh, the disciples experienced this help, or Jesus' disciples experienced the help that God sent them. And so we're going to have a story time for just a second. Don't worry, it's not too long. But I want to read the way it puts this and the help that's available to us. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in a stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed. The door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus told them. I am going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So here they were, waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was just being scared and hiding. You can't blame them. Their best friend had left. The important people and the leaders were after them. And Jesus had given them a job they didn't know how to do. As they waited, they were praying and remembering. Remembering how, from the beginning... God had been working out his secret rescue plan. Suddenly, a strong wind filled their little room, whistling through the walls, rustling the straw on the floor, and there, on everyone's heads, shining in the gloom, were flickering flames, fire that didn't hurt or burn, and something more. Inside their hearts, they felt a strange heat, almost as if all the coldness and hardness were melting away. As if their broken hearts were mending, and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly. How it happened, they didn't know, but they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze, and Jesus himself was coming to live inside of them. They had seen Jesus go away, but now he was closer than he had ever been inside their hearts. In this time, nothing could separate them. Jesus would always be there with them, loving them, whispering the promise that he would rid them of the terrible poison and terrible lie and sickness in their hearts. God's wonderful promise to them, you are my child and I love you. Make your home in me And I, as I make my home in you, Jesus said. Could it be that heaven was coming into their hearts? They threw open the shutters, sunlight flooded their room as love had flooded their hearts. And the little room was filled with happy noises, dancing feet, singing and laughing. They unlocked the door and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice so everyone could hear, Jesus died for you. He said, because he 
loves you. But God made him alive again. He has rescued you. People stopped and listened. The word sank down deep into their hearts and worked like a medicine that makes you well. Like the antidote to a deadly poison. Like a kiss that wakes you up from a deep sleep. Stop running away from God, Peter said. Run to him instead so he can love you and make you free. And Peter told them the wonderful story of God's love. God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever kind of love. How Jesus had come and all that happened. I share that story because of the powerful truth and the opportunity that we have to experience that. Every single one of us. That before, again, any weed killer or any anchor that we would need uh, to pick up, that there is a help and a strength beyond our own. And I was reminded this week, I sat um, at home and I was writing and praying and I read this story and I thought back to a time in college, so I'll just be really honest with you, I had a year in college my freshman year, um, it was one of those seasons that you, you know, we all have those seasons we look back on, like that was a really hard season, right? And it was my freshman year and my grandma had just passed away um, and I just, I found myself um, in this season where I was dealing with grief um, on top of transition, going to college for the first time, trying to figure out what career, like, God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? And I knew Jesus, and I had accepted him as my Savior. Um, but I was in this season where I was trying to do everything on my own. And by everything, I mean dealing with the grief, dealing with the stress, dealing with... And I found that I had this stronghold of um, anger. Like, I didn't know why I would get so angry. Why this anger would rise up in me and this worry and this... Um, I don't even know. I, don't even, just, I didn't like it. I didn't like it about myself. I didn't like it. And I went to class one day and... Um, I was in a class that I, that I was trying to see if it was a career that I wanted to go into. And so I took the intro class, and I'm sitting there, and we had this guest speaker come in, and in my uh, freshman attitude, I was like, okay, let's see what you got to say, okay? Like, hit us, like, you know, and like, give us something good kind of thing. Again, attitude issues, okay? Uh, and I remember I sat there, and the speaker uh, just started talking about purpose, like, he just started talking about purpose, and uh, this is so random. I don't know, I wasn't going to tell you this part, but he took off his shoe. Like, this guy, this guy was real crazy. He took off his shoe, and he's like, a shoe will never be satisfied if a shoe keeps trying to act like a flashlight. And I was like, you know, like, not overly profound kind of thing. But I tell you, I sat in the back of that room, and all of a sudden, there was this experience now knowing where the Holy Spirit came over me. And it wasn't that trouble went away. It wasn't that grief didn't go away. It wasn't that it just, everything just vanished. But there was a peace and a clarity to the strongholds. There was a peace and a clarity to the decisions. There was a peace and a clarity and a realization that Laura you have got to stop trying to do it all on your own. Get rid of only the checklist. And I left the class. I was the only one crying, so embarrassing. I left the class. No one else really found that statement of his that profound. And I left the class, and I sat in my car. And as the memories of those months flooded, the grief, the anger, the frustration with myself, as the memories of those months flooded in the car, I felt like the Lord spoke to me, not in an audible voice, but in a way that I know exactly what he was saying. He said, will you fight for me? Will you fight for me? And again, it's not that life 
just became perfect, but there was a realization that there is a Holy Spirit that wants to walk with me and through me in these decisions, in these victories, in these troubling times, in these strongholds, that there is victory possible. Will you fight for me, Laura? And I said, yes, I'll fight for you. And it was in that moment that he, that he did make clear the calling that I was supposed to go into and the, what he was calling me to spend my life doing. And I share that with you because as I sat this week, you know, real life is, is that we continue to have seasons. <laughs> Grief doesn't stop. Temptation doesn't stop. That strongholds can come up in life. And as I sat there this week, and I was thinking back to this, I'm sitting in a recliner in our house, and I felt like as I'm reliving this story and, be, and reminding myself of the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the disciples' life, not in just in my life, but in the lives that I've seen around me, there was this realization that, Laura, I am anxious to do this again. That as strongholds have come and, and you're frustrated with yourself now about different things, like why don't you stop worrying about stuff? Why do you keep overanalyzing everything, Laura? The stuff that I get really tired of, my, of myself doing right now, it was a realization there's the same Holy Spirit who wants to fill. There's the same Holy Spirit that wants to fill again and wants to say, Laura, it's more than a checklist. It's more than do this and do that and everything will go away that I want to walk with you and I want to fill you and I want to give you victory both then and both now because God sent help. And he is anxious to fill us and to help us. He is anxious to give you victory. But friends, I was reminded that that anxiousness to fill me is the same it is for you. It's not just me. This is, it's for you too. But before any list, to take back your life, you have to be willing to lay it down. We have a choice and we have the ability to say, my life is laid down to you, Lord. Fill me. That I will walk these steps in your strength and not my own. So, as we look at these quickly, we'll look at different things that I want to give you. I felt like I couldn't go into a list without sharing that first. The greatest way to take back your life is to lay it down. And there's a Holy Spirit available and anxious and ready to walk with you in the strongholds, and through each and every layer and every lie of the enemy to be replaced with a truth that will set you free. He's anxious to do that. The first one, the first on this list, and so as we go through it, we're, we're seeing this list in light of the help that is available to us, not in something just to add to your daily to-do list, in light of the Holy Spirit that wants to give you strength. And the first one is to identify the stronghold. Levi Lusco, the writer of the book Take Back Your Life and the creator of this series, says you can't win a conflict you don't admit you're in. That's a word right there, right? You can't, you can't win a conflict that you don't admit you're in. Now, for some, the stronghold or the habit or the sin or the weakness, the thing that, that drives you nuts, it's like, okay, I got it. I know mine, right? But for some, it may take time to try to pinpoint what, it, what is it about it. And so the Lord is faithful to reveal that. And so I encourage you to spend time to try to identify what that is so that you can begin to break down the layer by layer. But what, here's the question. What personal darkness are you fed up with? What is the stronghold? What has you moving in the river rather than standing firm? And what are you so frustrated with that you can't quit? What has left you depleted? Identify the stronghold so you can begin to break down the layers. The second one, be ready for battle. The verses we've been looking at are in 2 Corinthians, give us insight into how to be battle ready. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments, to destroy the lies. 
So as we go through the layers and as we identify the stronghold, what is it? There are things that you can do to be battle ready, right? Not in a strength on your own, but in a strength that God sent help to do. And there are things that you can do to be battle ready. And the first one, first and foremost, is to fall in love with the word. It's to fall in love with the word so that you know the word. And as the lies come up and you realize, wow, that's this layer of lie and is this layer of lie. And I don't, I don't feel like that's true, right? You're not only just, you're not moving past it. You're not just moving on. You're not just dismissing, but you're replacing. No, that's not true. That's from the enemy. This is what God's word says. But to know that, we have to fall in love and be hungry with the word. And as Pastor Elizabeth shared a few weeks ago, there are all kinds of ways and resources to just dive in. And I know the Bible Project has been incredible, but the YouVersion app, there's all kinds of ways to dive in. But when you know the word, you're able then to replace the lies with truth, to fall in love with the word. The famous philosopher and author Dallas Willard said, the ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the ability to select what we will will allow or require our minds to dwell upon. That we have the choice to dwell upon the lies or to dwell upon the truth. But to know the truth, we have to continue to fall in love with the truth and find ways to learn the truth, to be in God's word the second way to be battle ready, another anchor or a weed killer, is community. You hear us talk a lot about community here at Waterline. Well, here's why we talk about community. Because when the river of life is coming real fast, and the river of life and the, and the culture is coming in the current, uh, you have friends around you, godly people, that help you say, stand firm. That's not true. Or here is truth. Here's a hand right? That's biblical community. It's not a cheap hangout time. It's a what does God's word say about this? Let's point each other to the Savior. Let's remind each other that there is something way beyond our own strength. Biblical community serves as a reminder and a, and a glorifier of Christ in your life. Some of the greatest community I've ever experienced were when people would stand in the river with me and speak truth that I really probably at the time didn't want to hear. But it planted my feet. It reminded me of who God is and who he says I am. Whether I wanted to hear it at the time or not. That's what biblical community is. That is the goal for each and every one of our life groups. Is that it's not just a hangout. Trust me, we love to celebrate and hang out. But it would be a time that as you identify a stronghold, that you have a friend and someone standing there with you that says, plant your feet. Get rooted in truth. That's a lie. That's biblical community. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And finally, to be ready for battle, you have the word biblical community. Another way to anchor is in worship. Worship takes our eyes off of ourselves and fixes them on the truth of the Lord. Many people have said, it's really impossible to worship and worry at the same time. Anyone in here has a stronghold of worry or overanalyzing? It's really hard to worship and do both at the same time. You declare who God is, and you fix your eyes. Colossians 3.16, let the message about Christ in all its richness Fill our lives, teach and counsel each other with the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and, and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Battle ready. Word, community, and worship. Layer by layer. Taking down lie by lie. Not in your strength. In his. Who is so available. Remember, anxious to fill you. He's anxious to fill you. 
Because again, that while we know there are strongholds and that they do exist, loud and clear, so can victory. And as your friend this morning, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, wherever the stronghold of life or that habit, that thing that you're thinking of has you feeling depleted this morning, hear that truth. That there is a God who turns graves into gardens. <laughs> That's who he is. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing that. I want to go out declaring this evening we are going to have a time, another, like Pastor Scott said, another time of extended worship. But we're going to go out in the same way today. And we invite you to that this evening at 630, right here back in this room. And we're going to have time for prayer and time for uh, just to declare that, time to be together in community, time to just taking the time over and over and over again this evening at 630 to declare that truth. But I want to declare that today. That there is a God who turns graves into gardens, dry bones to ashes. There is a God that turns the sea, the morning. There is a God who wants to give you victory. So we're going to go out singing real loud today. Real loud. Because that's something we're celebrating. Would you sing with me?